Ladies and gentlemen, we introduce you Donald J. Trump. He's joining us today. Tremendous. It's rather lot huge. I don't know. I don't know how to fucking do the Donald Trump accent. Huge. It's huge. It's Tremendous. huge. This is only a hundred dollar one, but uh, anyway. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's Friday. Welcome to another episode of Reactionary Opinions. It is Friday, the seventeenth of May, and we are here dedicated. It's our ninth episode. We are one episode away from double digits. It's uh, Russell says he he didn't believe it, but I'm pretty sure he's confident that he, he did uh, believe it that we would make it this far. Uh, yeah, it's going to be quite an interesting um, episode uh, this week. Depressing, actually. Uh, we're going to be talking about the subject that, or the topic that is on everyone's, uh, the tip of everyone's tongue nowadays, which is the topic of the infamous expropriation without compensation. Ugh, yeah, I know. Key word, without compensation. Yeah, a rather, a rather shite topic for a Friday evening, but, uh, you know, we like to fight degeneracy and expropriation without compensation is definitely degeneracy. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what we're going to do today in uh, this evening's episode is we are going to break this conversation down into three points. We're going to be talking about the history of uh, expropriation without compensation and expropriation and the effects it has on the societies that are unfortunate enough to have to undergo those tyrannical uh, processes. And then we're going to be talking about uh, EWC or expropriation without compensation in South Africa and then the projections. Now, it's very important that for those of you that are listening that aren't aware of current affairs in South Africa, South African, the South African government is in the process now of proposing a uh, change of constitution because our constitution traditionally protects uh, property rights, um, but we, the government is proposing a, a, a change of the constitution in order to allow for expropriation without compensation. That proposal has been uh, around for quite a while now. They've been trying to push it through. Now with a one-third majority, uh, there's a chance that they could make this a reality. We're not going to get too far into the legal aspects of it, but I want Dylan and Russell. What I'm really excited about is Dylan and Russell's uh, breakdown of the history of expropriation without compensation. d Dog. You made some really cool notes over there about expropriation without compensation, specifically from with regards to the history of it. So go ahead, knock us dead, show us, tell us a little bit about the history of it. All right, word. So, of course, um, all states everywhere basically reserve the right to expropriate property, but they typically almost always do it with compensation. In the United States, we call this eminent domain. It's listed in the Constitution. It's been there since the beginning of the Republic. So basically for the purposes of building a dam or widening a road or building a railroad or whatever, the federal government reserves the right to expropriate your property and to pay you fair market value for it. Uh, municipalities and states can also do this too, I believe. Uh, so this is commonplace. This happens all over the world. And the thing about it, yes, you may have sentimental value tied to your property, but you won't be in a situation where a little old lady who lives in a house in New York City and your property's increased tremendously and they're going to build an underpass where your house is and it's worth $2 million now and you're shit out of luck because the government decided they want to build an underpass. So at the very least, she would be paid the value of that property and won't be in a poor house. Uh, instances where you see expropriation without compensation are a little more rare and particularly in what we would call civilized countries. <laughs> um, instances where you do see expropriation without compensation is in wartime situations. Uh, so, for instance, after the Second World War, Germans living east of the Rhine, basically, so in Czechoslovakia, 
or what is now the Czech Republic and other parts of Eastern and Central Europe were largely driven off their property and forced to go back to Germany, places some of them had never been. Um, but that was mostly due to nationalism and resentment at the German government and by extension, the German people after the end of the Third Reich. Uh, you also saw this happen in South Korea. So South Korea was colonized by the Japanese and following World War II between 1945 and 1950, all property that was held by Japanese entities or persons was expropriated by the South Korean government and then uh, redistributed. You also saw further expropriation happen in Korea during their five-year plans where large land holdings were obliged to divest, uh, large landholders were much, were obliged to divest much of their property to be redistributed. Uh, I believe this was for ostensibly um, modernization and industrialization efforts. Uh, you also saw instances happen in, in Hong Kong and Singapore where the government at some point uh, owned all the land. I'm not exactly sure when this took effect, but in those cases, um, property in Singapore can be effectively owned on a 99 year lease. So you, for practical purposes, own your property um, and the lease is good for you know a century basically. And it's transferable um, and it's, you're, you're not subject to arbitrary compensation. Yeah. Or, um, so arbitrary expropriation. So, yeah. Russell, if you can just sort of explain to us how that is, uh, from an economic standpoint, is it doesn't uh, sort of dissuade investors. Yeah, well, look, um, the idea is the, 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 the early examples didn't mention the things like wartime, um, the, the situation in, in Korea, situation in parts of uh, Eastern Europe, the Czech Republic. Those are matters around war, you know, and basically all throughout wartime, um, expropriation without a compensation happened, but that's kind of, you know, legitimate because that's, that's, you know, to the victors belong the spoils, you know what I mean? So that is yeah. just the way things are, unfortunately. Um, with the, as long as those, um, those in the modern day era where Dylan was saying with leases and their, their, their rights attached to those leases and what they're allowed to do on those leases, if the leases are transferable at a price, um, it, 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 it shouldn't have too much of an impact on um, industrialization and building of things like uh, shopping centers, residential units, um, factories, all that sort of thing. Yeah, um, when it also, Dylan mentioned in Korea, they obviously nationalized the whole thing so that they could just get the industrialization process done quickly. I would presume that was their reasoning behind it um, to you know, just get um, get the process going really quickly. So sometimes there's, there's uh, a lot of extra circumstances around um, around the uh, uh, idea of, um, you know, 99 year leases, Singapore and Hong Kong being very small islands. Um, it, it, it kind of, in a way, it, it would make sense to, to do that as long as um, as long as you, those leases are always transferable at a price. It doesn't. It still warrants investment. Well, I think it's. I think it's also because of, like you said, they're very small islands, so it's a geographic. Uh, you know, they have to sort of. You know, they don't have a lot of space to play with. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I think that's also very important. Now we must we must put this out there, guys, before uh, we get people freaking out and and all this sort of thing. Obviously, what we're talking about, ninety nine year leases and stuff, is not the you know the, the 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 ultimate first prize kind of thing it's not it's not as good as you know absolute property rights and and all that sort of thing um it's just you know when we're talking about expropriation without compensation it's not uh it's not as bad as ewc yeah it's not collect it's not soviet style collectivization is, is basically mm. what it is which leads into the Next point, so we're kind of going up the scales of extremity. So first we have eminent domain, state sees the land and state expropriates property but pays you for it. 
And then we have these instances of wartime situations, kind of what happened in uh, Korea, which was sort of a piecemeal um, nationalization and redistribution of certain land assets. Um, and now we go to uh, collectivization in the USSR and China. So I actually studied this in university quite a bit um, during the, in the Soviet example in particular. So what you had in that instance was um, first off, once the, you had a civil war in Russia during the 1920s and immediately following World War I, and uh, you had a situation called war communism. What war communism was, it was basically trying to, you could, you basically, it, it almost, it, it totally destroyed the economy <laughs> is what it did. And it was basically, it basically forced everything into a barter situation. So you're the government, you send your goons, you're running this factory, you're basically making the people work there. They can't leave. So they're basically factory slaves. And then you go out and like, we need more coal. We need more iron. And you basically shake down the mines for your shit. So mm -hmm. that was, that wasn't particularly, you know, obviously no one's investing in, in Russia at this time. I can't remember the exact numbers off my head, but war communism was disastrous. Like the, I think just one of the figures I'm trying to remember, but it was something like uh, by the end of the Russian civil war, something like 85% of all like uh, steel production had come offline just due to capital attrition and theft by the government and stuff. And because nobody wanted to invest in Russia, obviously. So, well, it probably wasn't real communism, that's why. Yeah, no, it was war communism, it's not real <laughs> communism. Uh, and then after that, during the 19, late 1920s, you had something called the uh, NEP, New Economic Policy, where basically the full-blown socialization efforts uh, weren't panning out too well. So Lenin at the time decided to allow for some degree of market activity to happen. So for instance, peasants could uh, have a little garden out back and sell some of the produce. And this actually accounted for a disproportionate amount of the economy, oops, sorry, in Russia at the time. Uh, of course, things end up going from bad to worse and then you have Stalin getting control and then you had mass collectivization. What collectivization was, is you had the government basically expropriate all land, specifically farmland, and in order to, farmland was particularly targeted, they did this with a lot of other shit, but uh, farmland was specifically yeah. targeted, and the yeah, whole goal... As far as I know, it wasn't just farmland, it was farm produce as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? You're right about that. and. Um, but the, the, the big idea with um, collectivization was we we're going to chop up these farms and put everyone on these big, you know, collectivized um, farms, make them work there instead of being landowners. They would basically work the land for the state. And, and that was, they're hoping it would work. And then they had a process attached to that called um, <clears throat> dekulakization, which is an actual word. So a kulak in <laughs> Russia, yeah, I know. I was no, reading this, I'm like, professor, what? Dekulakization is a word? <laughs> I have it. Is. it. Yeah, <sighs> dekulakization. So a kulak uh, was basically a, a rural landowner. So like basically what we would think of as like a middle-class farmer, right? He's not super rich, but he owns some land. Maybe he's got a number of people hired to work it so on and so forth. So they basically, the state demonized the kulaks. Uh, in some cases, they were able to turn the peasants against them and say like, hey, look at that kulak over there, take a shit, you know? And uh, so, but, but mostly a lot of it was they just sort of ran them out of town and either put them in a gulag or made them a, yeah. a, a laborer on land they had previously owned. Uh, Dylan, um, you should be able to confirm this for me, but 
This preceded the the uh, uh, Hollow de Moor, right? Yeah. This is exactly the, what happened before the Hollow de Moor. Yeah, and the Hollow de Moor, for those who don't know, was I think it is literally means Holocaust, but in like Ukrainian. Hollow de Moor, yeah. Hollow de Moor. So Hollow de Moor, yeah, was a man-made famine in Ukraine. So this is. Um, uh, what basically happened is this was after collectivization. So the state, of course, had quotas on how much grain they had to extract from certain regions. How much do we need from the Donbass region? How much do we need from Crimea? How much do we need, you know, so-and-so? And, -so. and uh, because of collectivization, they weren't able to produce much for a lot of reasons. Uh, first hey, Brian, off... I just, I just looked up the... The, the meaning of Holodomor, and it's derived from some Russian or Ukrainian word, and it means to kill by starvation. Yeah, they starved them out. Good so God. so basically what ended up happening is with collectivization, obviously you have mass um, uncertainty about investment. No one's going to put money into things. So you have a crunch on that. Secondly, um, you have the instance of the socialist calculation problem. So the state's not because they've basically largely destroyed the function that prices were doing mm -hmm. in the past. And now you're just basically trying to ration what you do have. And then, so that leads to sh shortages in all kinds of areas. And in the third instance, um, if you're not going to turn a profit, you also have low incentive to work. So you have all these problems at place. And then Ukraine's basically at a subsistence uh, level, or they've previously been known as the uh, breadbasket of Europe. The um, mm. soil of Ukraine was so uh, nutrient rich that they would actually use Ukrainian soil as fertilizer. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, um, just quickly, Dylan, um, lack of investment happens when you're. Uh, if, if you're a, one of these um, uh, Kulak uh, uh, farmers, you're relatively kind of a middle-class type farmer. You've got a bit of land. You produce a fair amount of produce. Um, the idea of collectivization of the of your produce means that um, if everything is collectivized, you could actually be a more skillful farmer, all right? Have yeah. a much bigger yield. You could have a much bigger yield on your farm. But the more you yield, the more they just steal. So why would you try and grow anymore? And that was that's the whole issue around uh, 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 the, this whole uh, collectivization thing. Because if the, the, any good farmer, or well, it's basically a, like a race to the bottom, essentially. Because the, now all of a sudden the state just comes in there and says, listen, um, we're going to take this many tons and we're only going to give you this price. You know, yeah. and then the guy that the guy that whose whose yield is not that great, he gets a, a you know he gets a maybe even a better price or worse price. So nobody really knows. Uh, there's no like bring your grain to the market and let's have an auction and determine the price for the day. And if you and if you want to sell, you can sell. If you don't sell, you take it back. That's how you know yeah. forcing people to sell at a particular price or no price at all is absolutely disastrous because they're not going to be wanting to produce anything. So that's how I presume that's the way I see this, this uh, Hollow de Moor came about. Yeah, and it's even worse than that because what ended up happening is they had uh, set quotas and the um, Soviet government would send basically um, collection agencies. So they oh, had oh, tax. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> so, so they had uh, tax in kind operations so if you were a farmer, you had a certain quota that you had to meet. And then, you know, com commissar so-and-so would roll by and basically load up the grain and take it out of town. And they went to uh, Ukraine and a lot of other places. And they said, hey, you know, where's the grain? Uh, sorry, you know, because of collectivization and the low, low energy, <laughs> because we're not able to make our own money money off of this, we don't actually have a lot. And there was actually a drought at this time. And uh, so basically the state's like, no, you will meet quota. And then they basically took all the grain in order to meet their national plan. And then they 
basically made it so the Ukrainians couldn't leave the region and they just starved. Yeah, so it was actually even worse. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so your, that, that situation's even worse than the one I was, my one is the one that I came up with was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, just a, a sequence of unfortunate events. It was even much worse. Yeah. So. yeah, and in a lot of, in the Soviet Union in general, you had more, a lot of it was just, like you said, a series of unfortunate events, you know, you, you multiply a small problem nationwide and then all of a sudden you have mass shortages and someone ends up, um, you know, having to deal with it. But in the case of the Holodomor in Ukraine, um, this was an explicit policy. Um, Stalin was trying to send a message, look, you're going to produce, I don't care how the hell you feel. You're going to make it. Otherwise we're going to starve you to death is basically what the message. And, uh, a lot of the famines and stuff that ended up um, had preceded had kind of sort of, sort of withered away a little bit, but that was only after basically pulling a a Death Star <laughs> Death Star negotiation tactics, where he just you know destroys a whole country basically and starves a huge chunk of the population. So yep. guys, I just want to I just want to I just want to bring us back to the uh, where we were going. So we spoken about uh the soviet union and ukraine and and all these other terrible examples of um expropriation without compensation is just terrible horrible yeah. horrible horrible so let's talk about thing that's uh, that's more uh recent and uh it'll be a lot a lot easier for a lot of people to understand let's talk about the land expropriation in venezuela oh yeah <laughs> So uh, you want to you want to tackle that a little bit, Russell? Um, I actually I actually don't know much about uh, uh, Venezuela at all. Um, oh, it's all good. I I don't know I don't know much about the Venezuelan uh, question. Hmm. Well, basically, you know, it's difficult. You know, it's difficult. It, 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 you know, you don't know much about it. Hmm. Well, basically, what ended up happening is under um, Hugo Chavez. They started uh, nationalizing uh, certain businesses and stuff, just basically walking down the street and like, ah, this, this is for the people, and that's for the people, and that's for the people. And then basically uh, you didn't have the mass sort of starvations and reckless uh, um, or the, the degree of reckless expropriation that you had in – the Soviet Union, nor did you have a targeted starvation campaign <laughs> like you did in Ukraine. Uh, but the effect was just basically a um, a, 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 uh, yeah. a a less severe version of what you had happened in Russia. Simply put, like what you say, when the government starts expropriating property without compensation, people get nervous and then they don't invest. And the ones who do don't expand because they don't know if they're invest because they don't know if adding on to their existing plant or whatnot is going to be stolen down the line. So basically, you had a uh, uh, wow, shit. I can't figure the word a, a paralysis of the uh, economy starting under Chavez, where people just started getting scared because the government was taking their shit. In a very basic way, uh, I know that I know that. I, uh, sorry, I, Russell, carry on. I know that um, when um, Chavez took over, when was it? About two thousand and five, around there somewhere. Um, Something like that, early two thousands or late nineties. Yeah, two thousand, yeah, early two thousands, and basically up until bar a little bit of a blip in two thousand and seven, eight. Um, we had very high oil prices right up to 2013, and the very high oil prices um, uh, 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 masked a lot of um, Venezuela's problems for a long time. So when they, yeah. you, you, and then when they, when they, and then after the financial crisis, he actually nationalized the um, uh, uh, oil industries as well, and that was even worse—the worst thing he could possibly have done. And now you've got a situation where Venezuela has actually got a lot of um, a lot of oil reserves and that sort of thing, but they're not uh, they're not pumping because it's now because of you know people think resources 
resources, resources. It's a wealthy country. It's a wealthy country. That's complete nonsense. Russell, you know, Russell, don't you think, uh, don't you think it's Russell? Don't you think it's incredibly amazing yes. and and and, uh, and ironic almost that almost all the countries that implement um, expropriation without compensation and all these horrible ideas are countries that have an abundance of resources. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the thing is, it's basically, you know, the the the, the gangsters want to get their greedy, greedy little paws on everything. You know what I mean? That's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. In a nutshell, yeah. Dylan, can I just say something quickly? In 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 basic terms, guys, um, with regards to the the economic disasters that um, expropriation without compensation um, brings about, Dylan made a good example where he said. Uh, you know, investors and people aren't going to sort of build on their plant and build on their factory or whatever because they're afraid that it's going to be stolen. If I could bring this, I could bring this sort of into a micro idea. You're not going to buy a house. You're not going to build onto your house or whatever, or you're not going to buy an expensive furniture and expensive TVs if you know that someone can literally just walk into your house and take it. It's it's in the most basic of terms. So I don't understand how how and why things like expropriation without compensation is such an easy sell. Yeah, they're able to they they spin it really good and they're like, oh no, it's not gonna be as bad. I'm like, yeah, but at the end of the day, you don't know if the government's gonna take your property or not. So why are you going to invest? you know, a hundred thousand dollars, a million rand or whatever it is into something that you don't know if you're going to own <laughs> in five years time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just as simple stupid. as that. It's as simple as you that. See, the thing is, you, you basically, if you want to have a, a good economy, your basis has to be um, capital preservation, all right, and capital accumulation. You've got to be able to, to preserve and, and advance those two things, all right? That's why capitalism works because it relies on re in, uh, on security of investment and reinvestment. That's where you get your growth from. If you can't have property rights attached to that, you're not going to get either. You're not going to keep your capital, and you're not going to get the reinvestment that is so desperately needed to increase production, keep more people employed, etc., etc., etc. Collect more taxes, even in the long run. So guys, I just want to I just want to touch on this. So we've spoken about the history of um, expropriation without compensation and all kinds of other expropriations um, all over the world and stuff. I think um, we should touch on expropriation in uh, or EWC or expropriation without compensation in South Africa. So uh, Dylan made a, an interesting thing, uh, interesting comment over here with regards to colonial past. Uh, do you want to just sort of run us by what you mean by that, the dog? Uh, are you talking about in um, in South Africa? South Africa. Oh yeah. Well, you see this happen in a lot of colonies. You know, you have foreigners come in, and then you know they either find nobody there, or they have the situation we were talking about earlier where there's a war or conflict and then afterwards, you know, to the victor go to the spoils type of situation. Um, you also have instances during, uh, in, with the, what was it? What was that act in 1913? I'm totally spacing on it. The native, uh, the native land act. Native the native land, land, land act. act. Yeah. So that, that also was a, a you could call that a, an, an expropriation of sorts where it sort of, um, Places well, that had previous. Oh, go, you want to go ahead, Russell? Well, people misconceive the the, the the 1913 Land Act. I actually read it the other day, and do yourself a favor, read it. If you actually read it, you can see what the intent was behind that. It wasn't used as a as a tool for expropriation at all. What it did was it basically said, um, "Listen, we live in a country. We don't uh, uh, where there are lots of different interest groups, right?" And we don't want to destabilize. I'm pretty sure I can put your my, my neck out and say the thinking behind it. I didn't look at the reasoning behind it and then all that stuff. But if you look at the act, it's clear the, that that act is there to preserve um, a, a land for the original for for uh, the land areas that were originally settled and settled by the Bantu tribes. No doubt about it. Um, that it was 
basically it, it it stopped any white person basically from purchasing or even leasing land from land from those designated areas um it was used as a one to it was actually it actually was used to enforce bantu ownership or at least bantu not necessarily ownership but bantu custodianship without greedy uh, uh white oaks uh, essentially making deals and buying up their land and destabilizing the social fabric of the country. That was the reason for the 1913 Natives Act. Controversially, I know it sounds controversial, but I've read the act. There is, there is just no way that was an expropriation like a uh, uh, piece of legislation. Uh, I can't speak too much on it, but the only thing I do know is that with the uh, Native Land Act, is it it, it, it only sort of basically set aside a small chunk of what was South Africa. Now, of course, with population density at the time, um, you know, we're not talking about 55 million people in uh, South Africa. 1930, so, South Africa's population was about 6 million for the whole Yeah, period. exactly. So even though it was... Right. So it wasn't... Um, it wasn't uh, as as extreme as it would be now. Now, of course, over time, what that did as the population grew, I think that I think it could pretty easily be argued that that ended up causing some social friction and whatnot. But we'll save that for another time. Uh, you also had uh, expropriation in in uh, some instance areas with the Group Areas Act. So I actually live in. Well, that, uh, was, that was that was mainly actually in urban areas. It didn't affect yes. that much. Exactly. Yeah, it didn't affect farmland that much. So, uh, like the area I'm in, uh, Zona Bloom, uh, was actually part of District Six, I think, back in the day. And then so some people were moved out. So, no, no, look, it was quite, it was it was very look the, the 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 moving people around in the urban areas was uh, crazy. Uh, was was very um, well documented. Yeah. So, yeah. anyways, I have a. Uh, in, I think South Africa in particular is a in, uh, sort of ripe for this sort of nationalization and expropriation without con compensation rhetoric due to its history. But mm -hmm. the thing about it is, is you can't, you don't, you, you, an, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, A, and B, it's not going to have the effects you think it does. So... Mm -hmm. when we were talking about these Soviet examples earlier on and all the problems that were caused with that expropriation, and even with the less extreme <clears throat> Venezuelan example, you end up having some pretty, um, pretty bad phenomenon happen as a result of those policies. Mm -hmm. um, and the interesting thing to me about it is just how despite all this talk and rhetoric about expropriation without compensation, there's very little detail about what they exactly mean, aside mm. from the EFF. The EFF has made it pretty clear that they want state ownership of all land. And then basically, wow. I think their idea was to have a lease system. and allow, So basically, they just swoop in, take everything, and then issue you a lease to a place that you had previously owned. Um, the ANC's platform has been much more undecisive as far as I'm able to determine. Have you guys heard anything clear about, about no, any of this? Because I haven't. They, 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 um, they seem to be, even, even Julian Lemmer the other day, before the elections, he was, he was saying how the, the ANC is really um, you know, fiddling with the, with the policy and they're not being clear about it, uh, whereas his party is... Uh, so even Julius Malema was saying how wishy-washy actually the, the ANC is on this, on this um, whole uh, issue of EWC expropriation without compensation. Yeah, I, I, and also I would tend to agree with him as well. Yeah. No, I just, because I don't, I don't know anything that they've, like, like I've heard they want to change the constitution for it, but I haven't heard any plans, no policies, no nothing from the ANC. So I think that's part of the problem going on right now. Is people don't even know what they mean. They don't even know what they mean when they talk about expropriation without well, conversation. I think what happened was, the reason why this, it is like, like this, uh, Dylan, was because 
all of a sudden at the when was it in the December 2017 December 2017 um, elective Congress at the ANC right all of a sudden out of the way um, the Zuma faction of the ANC brought up the issue of EWC and it became a, it became a, a topic all right and essentially what um, Sil Ramaphosa uh, had to do is he had to um, say put on the table to get elected as president so it was a very, it was very rushed sort of thing that he put on the table, uh, and then when he got elected, um, he basically made a speech about EWC uh, expropriation without compensation and everything. And then that, when Parliament opened immediately, when Parliament opened in, in February 2018, um, the EFF put forward that motion to amend the constitution. Then the ANC basically had to. Um, put forward a proposal to say that they are serious type of thing in order to, be, to outflank the, the, the EFF. That's why, and then was, so that's why ANC policy is, is really wishy-washy on the thing because they have, it, it's kind of a rushed thing for them. So they don't have a, no. uh, it's not something that's clear and really clear and concise in their end. No. No, but they've given, they've, been given, they've been given a mandate by their voters, bro. Yeah, uh, Russell. true, true. But I mean, the thing is that they, they, they've been given a mandate for lots of things. You know, they don't actually, the advantage with the ANC, the advantage with the ANC is that they don't have to keep their word. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. that's, that's, that, that's the problem with the DA. The DA has got to keep its word. Yeah, it's <laughs> that. very interesting. That the ANC very, can afford to lie. It's fine. They can. They can. They can. Um, what? Because I mean, the thing is, they got re-elected with all the state capture news and that sort of thing. What's to stop them from getting re-elected if they just renege on the the EWC thing? They never have yeah. to follow through on. What they, they never have to follow through on what they do. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. So and they, and. Hey, you know, this is the this is the thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's a bit of a wild gamble there, Russell. But you know, I get what you're saying. Yeah, and it seems to me like in 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 particularly in South Africa today, where's the high value land? It's all urban. It, you know, For South real. Africa is an industrialized slash industrializing, or it was until you know about 2008, <laughs> uh, industrializing yeah. economy. And so all the property value is in the cities. People are all flocking to the cities. I mean, here in Cape Town, the amount of people who have moved in over the past, you know, 10 years or so is tremendous. Yeah. I mean, like geez. places like Kailicha have exploded um, yeah. in terms of size. So a lot of this talk seems to be, this rhetoric seems to be focused on farmland, but People don't want farmland. <laughs> they they no, want they want, want urban farm. land. Even the even the so-called land grabs. I haven't heard all the land grabs are in um, uh, 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 in and around existing townships, etc. People wanting to grab a bit of land to go and build some shacks on. That's yeah. the land grabs, and that makes sense to me. That is the land that people actually want. Yeah. You know, because it gives them opportunities to be close to where the jobs are, the action is happening. Right. You know. It, it gives them a little bit more opportunity than some piece of land far away from anything. Well, yeah. guys, this also this also ties in with uh, the point that that Dylan made is, you know, I think for the for the for the average South African, uh, land is a minor minor issue in their minds. It's just those those sort of cardinal problems which are jobs, drug immigration, and education. So those are the the main things that are most important to the average South African. And I think that this whole land issue and stuff, most most people really don't give a shit about that because I think I think I think I think in essence the most people understand that a piece of land isn't gonna build wealth, you know, understand. Or or resources are worthless unless they are able to generate wealth, you understand? So yeah. so that, that I think I think most people understand that and 
I think there are stats out there. I think it was the IRR that did the, or the Institute on Racial Relations that did a study on uh, the, the percentage of uh, South Africans who consider land to be the, the biggest issue. And I think it was something. It's like something, 2%. It was like, it was like the seventh or eighth biggest issue. The seventh or eighth biggest issue, I, I think I recall correctly. Yeah, but I mean, I'm saying, I'm saying the percentage of people who believe it to be the most important thing is probably about 2%. Yeah, yeah. well, it's below 10%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But interestingly, interestingly enough, about uh, land reform as a whole in South Africa, the government over the last, I think, 15, 20 odd years has been buying up farms from farmers, all right, and almost, no, almost uh, none of them have actually been um, uh, transferred in terms of title back to the individuals or to whoever the claimants were on those land issues, all right? Um, so basically the, the ANC then is now the, the, the either the Department of Land and Agriculture Department probably owns it or some sort of state entity. The reason I think what they, the, 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 and the, the reason why the, 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 the ANC government doesn't want to give people title all right, because they know that people don't want the land, they want the money. So if they give the land yeah. to the people as individuals, they're going to sell it probably back to a white person and the land's back in white people's hands again. Mm -hmm. That's why they won't do it. Nobody's got the, no, the ANC will never admit that, but that's why. Well, that's what, that's, it's, quite, it's quite obvious why they don't want to give them title deeds in my mind. I mean, what other, apart from, apart from them just wanting sort of, you know, infinite power and over their their minions and stuff. I mean, the, the I, I, I mean yeah. I mean, there's there's no there's no other. I mean, from a practical perspective, I think the only reason why they 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 don't hand over title deeds is exactly what Russell said. Yeah. In my a mind. desperate a desperate electorate is a pliable electorate. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so. Guys, I want to I want to talk about. We've been going for almost almost an hour. I want to talk about what you guys think is going to be happening in the next uh, couple of years with regards to um, EWC specifically. So basically, our projections. So we've spoken about the history. We've spoken about EWC in South Africa, and I want to I want us to sort of talk about the projections and what we think. Uh, is going to happen in the next uh, few years. Can I can I give a can I give a, a, a rundown quick? Yeah, I think you yeah, go yeah, first, do it. Scott. Yeah, yeah, go for it, Scott. So, um, you know, we spoke about ANC and how they they don't really need to stick to the mandate that their voters gave them because their voters will will always just vote for them because, like I've said before, they are the eternal liberation party. So they will always be, you know, voted in, voted in. So they don't need to, um, they don't need to stick, or they don't need to do anything, pretty much. So there's a chance that Shaw, uh, Saint Cyril might sort of brush the whole EWC, EWC thing under the under the mat or whatever. And there's a lot of people banking on that over here. However, there's one there's one factor that we that we didn't. Think about guys, and that's old uh, old Julius himself. Now, say what you want to say about Julius, but I've said this before: is Julius is and same as um, as Andy Lem Gutama, maybe not as much, but Julius Malema is very fast in his racism, and he really, he really, honestly wants to see this EWC thing put through because Julius Malema is an outright Marxist. Um, he doesn't believe that people should own anything. He wants the state to own everything. And he has said this many, 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 many times. So here, I think that in Parliament, Julius Malema is going to hold St. Cyril's feet to the coals and push him for this whole EWC. So keep it in the spotlight. Keep talking about it. Keep you know on about it and all that because you must know that that the EW uh, the EW <laughs> the WWE the the EFF has now got a massive amount of seats in Parliament compared to what they had. They can make more noise. 
they can cause more fights. Uh, so the EWC thing is going to be pushed by uh, uh, Malema. Uh, I, Hello? Hello? Oh, jeez. And Scott. Hello? Hello, I'm Scott. Losing you. Hello? Yeah, we lost you, Scott. I'm here. We I'm lost here. you. I'm right here. I'm right, right. here. Hello? OK, we hear you. Yeah. Hello, can you hear us? Yeah. How long did you miss me then? For a uh, while. Back. Seconds. Yeah, you dropped when right. you were talking about how Malema is going to push for um, uh, yeah. make it a so, make it an issue for everybody. So I think that EWC is going to be pushed by Malema. He's going to hold uh, Cyril's feet to the coals, and I think that he is going to be because they've got more seats in Parliament now. They're going to noise, cause more fights, and push EWC within Parliament. I don't think I think that. Like we said, the ANC, they, they're incredibly incompetent. But I think uh, an oak like Julius Malema is going to just let this slide because of his Marxist tendencies. And that's it. Okay. Are you gonna what do you think, Russell? You go first. Well, they're going to have to, they're going to have to uh, give, they're going to have to, do, uh, uh, they can't, they're in it now, they have to give the, the EFF something, all right? They have to do some type of uh, 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 policy. Um, what they're probably going to do is they, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, going to modify a land expropriation bill um, to kind of uh, allow for it in, and then give the circumstances for it. And then they're going to act on a few times on those circumstances and um, that should be able to say, yeah, look, hey, we, we, we've uh, expropriated without compensation. You know, there it is. You know, they're going to they're going to uh, they, they're going to have to throw they're going to have to throw the EFF a bone. You know what I mean? Um, and what would happen is and then once once the uh, once that thing is once they've they, they can then say, OK, land or and this issue has been dealt with sort of thing you know what i mean then they can say um, down Russell, sorry sorry let me let me just stop you there quickly they can't do that they can't they can't e expropriate without compensation just willy-nilly now because no, right, I, it's, right no, now it's being unconstitutional so the only way that they can do it is by amending the constitution and once they've amended the constitution sorry pal it's too late yeah. so they can't just they can't just do an example they can't just like expropriate of someone's farm without compensation because now under the constitution that's theft so they have to, they have to but what i'm saying is constitution before they can do like, that. yeah but what i said was um you know they're going to try and uh, they're going to do their level best to try and figure out a way where they can um do some do an amendment all right but they're probably going to try push through an amendment light not something that uh, uh, which which allows them in very extreme in, in like extreme circumstances to expropriate without compensation, then modify the expropriation legislation to tie in with it and set out the circumstances within which it can happen. That's what I mean. So they are, there is going to be, make no mistakes about it, there is going to be a constitutional amendment. You can bet your bottom dollar. All right. So, so kind of like a, kind of like a, an eminent do domain, but, uh, you know, for, for the, for, for, uh, sort of public things like building a dam and that sort of thing that they that they'll explore well, the whole idea the whole idea is that you know okay fine the whole idea hasn't been because the, 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 the issue has been we must expropriate it without compensation okay fine we can do that but you can't they can still the, the ANC still can say look we can't do it arbitrarily you know we can't do it arbitrarily that's actually against all sorts of international law that's against all sorts of um, uh, 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 agreements that are signed that's against all um, uh, we, we basically become a um, a uh, what do you call it a, a rogue state if we do that all right but we can the issue the issue in the media the issue in everybody's mind expropriation without compensation so they, they've 
So the, the, as long as you just do some expropriation without compensation, you'll get away with it, so to speak. You know what I mean? You create very specific terms of it. And then once you've said that, hey, listen, then they promote the idea. Listen, we are ex we have expropriated without compensation. What are you do? What are you what are you thinking? Hey, this is all dealt with. We can't arbitrarily do it. You can't just say uh, this this guy on this piece of land here or this piece of property here. It, can, it, it, it just there's just no ways they can do it arbitrarily. They have to have a case for it first. You know what I mean? It still has to go to court. You can't just do it arbitrarily. Even if they do amend the constitution, there's just no ways they can go and do it arbitrarily um, with, without compensation. Just suddenly walk into a place and say, okay, well, listen, you're a white guy. This is land. You can't own land. You you stole it. Get off. You know, they can't. It has to go via the courts. You know what I mean? So they, they are going to change the constitution. Make no, they are, they, they, there's just no ways they, they can get away with that part of things. Although, notwithstanding what I've just said, the ANC gets away with just about anything. Um, maybe they can get away with this not doing it either. I don't know. But uh, um, And then once they've done that, once they've ch allowed for expropriation without, without constant compensation, then the matter is pretty much settled. Then what's Julius going to do? Yeah. No, that's sort well, of that's my... What's Julius going to do? What's Julius going to do? You know what I mean? Bro, Julius, Julius, Julius Malema will never get bored, bro. He'll always find something to do. Believe yeah, me. but look, like, no, but I mean, like, he hasn't, you know, I mean, the thing is, he, he, he's actually staked his whole uh, 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 um, campaign on all this sort of thing. Now, if the ANC goes ahead and does it, and all take those the wind out of his sails is what you're thinking. The wind out of his sails. What else has he got left? You know, nationalize I mean? the Reserve Bank. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But even there as well. There as well. There as well. You can also uh, there as well. You can also nationalize the Reserve Bank, and um, you can still maintain the status quo there as well. Yeah. Nationalizing the Reserve Bank is not a. You, you can still do it without any effects. Technically, yeah. No, yeah, because, I mean, a, a, a reserve bank is not about ownership; it's about control. Yeah, no, that's that's certainly true. You know, so, I think you know you can still say, yeah, we nat we not we we basically we basically yeah we'll own all the shares then, all right, but then issue no control over it. You know, mm -hmm. so that is nationalized. We own. You get what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you know, you can still you can still uh, play the game. Uh, um, you know. People in the electorate aren't that wised up, you know. You can say, "Oh, we have nationalized the Reserve Bank. We have done expropriation without compensation." Yeah, all these sorts of things. Yeah, no, I think I think you're sort of right, Russell. I think probably what's the the point behind what the ANC is going to do is they're going, they're probably trying to take the wind out of Julius Malena, Julius's sails without causing too much of a shitstorm. Is I basically Correct. think what's that's what I would think as well. So if they, I do expect them to amend the constitution, or to at the very least do some sort of token expropriations. Um, but Correct. if they do, but if they do actually make an amendment, I imagine they're going to try and make it fairly restrictive. So the government reserves the right to expropriate unused land which is under title which has not been developed within five years time or something like that you know well, strict, strict criteria around it yeah so i don't think it's going to be a good thing but i don't think they're going to go i i, <laughs> I don't think they're going to have their own dequilization if you get what i mean so <laughs> it, it's it's not going to be good but it's not going to be you know the end of the end of south africa so they're going to they're going to um my my thing is i'm a betting if i was going to bet on it they're going to go with ewc light yeah yeah no that's that's exactly what i think and then so they can go to eff supporters or people who are interested in ewc and say look no we changed the constitution and here's this piece of land that we expropriated which was owned by a belgian investment company which they've sat on for five years in hopes that the property value will go up so that they can sell it for profit. Something like that, you know? Yeah, they're going to, they, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly uh, what, I, what I think. And then, and then um, because it's, it's pretty clear from election results that 
basically EFF supporters, current EFF supporters are just former ANC voters anyway. Yeah. Guys, I think we're missing something again. I think you guys are banking on the fact that, uh, or, or you guys are you guys are you are banking on EFF voters not being absolute anarchists, and I think a lot of the EFF voters are absolute anarchists, and they want to see this place burn, bro. And you don't well, mean, so, and you don't mean anarchists in like a nice and cap sort of way. You mean <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. more like an, anti anti fast style anarchists, right? <laughs> Well, same look, thing. I mean, the thing is, same thing. If, if, if that happens, <laughs> then if that happens, we cross that bridge when we get there. I think that's what yeah. the uh, ANC will be uh, uh, thinking. You know, if they go that route, we can't actually legitimately crack down on them without looking like bad people. Yeah. You know what, Russell? That that I think that I think you might be right there, hey? because I think that South Africans, in general, especially people that vote for. You know, oaks like the ANC and the EFF and, and all these, you know, crazy oaks and stuff is they are, oh gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? They are sort of your, they, they're, they're all like Bokman and, and Loud and all that sort of thing. When, when it's elections and stuff come after elections, they're timid as hell. So they don't, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not like outraged to the, to the point that, uh, they're very, they're very weak at being outraged after elections. Something, something strange. Yeah, well, look, fees and must fall and all that sort of thing, notwithstanding, you know. But yeah. having said that, it all depends on how, politically, how the uh, uh, ANC government sees it. If they decide to crack down, they can crack down. You know what I mean? Um, it all depends. You know, it's just a matter of them making the decision to crack down. If they if they if they get to the point, listen, we've done all these things, we've done this, we've done that. EFF, you've got nothing left to offer, and now you still want to go and burn stuff down. They can still, politic in a pure political sense, say, listen, we're going to crack down, and we, because we're actually the good people, we're the nice guys. The EFF are just fakes. Um, they can so, spin it that way. Yeah. So, so economically, I think um, I think that that it's still going to be a, a, a very rough period and stuff because any sort of investors or, or, or whatever people that want to start businesses and stuff, this, this sort of uncertainty of EWC light or maybe we might have outrage, maybe not, maybe, you know, the sure for fair, it's all fair well that, that the constitution uh, is more than likely going to be amended. But what's going to happen after that? Is it going to be full-on expropriation? Uh, you know, understand. So, from an economic point of view as well, I think that uh, it's going to be it's going to get rough. It's still going to be bad. Um, uh, it's not going to be it's not going to be a nice thing. Um, it's, it's not going to be bad. yeah. It's not going to be Zimbabwe, but it's not going to be good either. Yeah. No. No. no it, basically, it's 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 going to. Um, going to prevent any it's going to increase the social problems of the country it's going to probably set us back uh probably a couple of decades yeah I no i i um i think like what you're saying probably the biggest danger of this is just regime uncertainty you know that that whole phenomenon where you don't know what this government's going to do so you do nothing and then nothing Ooh. happens you know exactly so, and you know that's just lost time that's lost growth potential, that old compounding and interest thing doesn't work in your favor. Right. You know, well, well right. I mean, didn't, didn't, in, 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 in its defense, that, that's actually not really such a bad thing in South Africa, realistically speaking. <laughs> Steph, yeah, it's the, better, it's the, better the than regime, I'm talking about the regime uncertainty because remember remember what we were talking about in one of those uh, episodes was, was Really want uh, a party to have you know no more than thirty three percent of the of the votes that they can't do anything. You understand? And so that's yeah. so we we're in that position of uh, slide through and slide through while while hopefully uh, you know fighting the good fight and uh, getting the message out there. Yeah. No, totally. So I don't know. EWC, moral of the story, 
is bullshit. Don't do it. But uh, if you do, don't don't de kulak his eyes or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's still yeah, shit. Well, this is the thing, you know. It's still it's still a it's still a nonsense uh, uh, idea, but sometimes you know people 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 place more emphasis on politics. You know, pe politicians deal with politics; they don't deal with real real life issues. So they they their business is politics, not real life. Yeah, now I think yeah. this is much more of a red herring than any substantive change. Like what you're talking, Scott, uh, it's much what people care about. You know, jobs, crime, drugs education, immigration. These are real issues for people. And I view EWC as kind of a, a red herring that the ANC is waving like, oh, sweet. So we could take this thing, pump it up, get it really politicized. And then they won't notice that, <laughs> or hopefully that all of this other shit that they actually do care about isn't being addressed. Yeah, but Dylan, what, 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 what has got me absolutely stumped is why EWC is so much more of a hot then things like crime and trucks and all that i don't understand it. it doesn't make any sense the only reason it is is because that's all the government and the media is talking about fake news man yeah. Yeah, the, the basically basically the the, the 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 south african media is a com is completely um uh, I, 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 they, they they can't report on anything they get they, they are just the most useless media in, in the world they have to be i'm I, i'm sorry I, I, I cannot come across a more useless bunch of people to report any sort of thing in my life. Yeah. Don't, really, ever to, don't, ever, don't ever come to one of my prize and introduce yourself as a list. Sorry. I'll burn your meat. I'll burn your meat. <laughs> oh, shame. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> Poor journalists. So, um, oh, they're unless, you're, not, unless you're an independent journalist. Ah, uh, still. This is so interesting. One of our one of our fans, I won't mention his name. Um, he actually, uh, like a real fan, a guy that complimented us on the show and said you guys are doing a good job and everything. He says it's refreshing. Listen to this. It's refreshing to to not see intellectual journalists talking on on you. Yeah, okay. I'm not. I'm not I'm no fan of these journalists. They they, they can't they can't. Uh, uh, they, the, the idea the idea behind these interviewing journalists they're supposed to ask the questions that ordinary people in the street would want to ask, but it's almost never that. No. Yeah. You know why? You know why the guy said that? It's it always, was, it's always something lame like. So how racist are you? You know. <laughs> you know or something stupid. On a scale of one you know. to ten, how racist are you? <laughs> so the reason why. <laughs> The reason why uh, the Oak said that he enjoyed the fact that we're not sort of professional journalists and stuff is because he said it's more authentic, and mm -hmm. I think that's what that's what that's what we need out there is more sort of authentic Oaks on the on the road, Oaks that you know I mean for us this this is a a, a, a thing that we just decided to do on on a whim, and it's you know we like it we enjoy chatting about these sort of subjects. And I mean, we all have jobs, we all have families, we need to, you know, we're very busy and all that. And we set aside the time to get the message out there, which I think is vitally important. Yeah. No, Speaking of, you guys are good. Yeah. No, Speaking no, no, of, no. you're better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> but I'm the best. But I'm the best. Everybody agrees. Terrific. <laughs> Tremendous. Totally the best. Totally the best. Winning. Tired of winning. <laughs> Tired of winning. So, Tired of winning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess I um, know, yeah. let's make South Africa great again. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, okay. There, so, uh, we said pretty much everything we're going to say about EWC yeah. and what we yep. think. Ready to tie yeah. it off, Scott, and plug what we're doing next next week? Yeah. Next week's going to be a humdinger. We're going to get the Oaks all, we're going to get all the Jimmies rustled and all that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So <laughs> next week we are going to be talking about uh, nationalism. Uh, yeah, dark, nationalism. nationalism. Ooh, get all yeah. those uh, libertarians, Jimmy's rustled nicely. There. <laughs> uh, it's going to be folks folk start. Be of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the folks start. Yeah, we'll talk about. We'll call. We'll call the episode. Uh, 
reactionary folk start. <laughs> So yeah, guys, uh, join us next week. Uh, we, we're going to be going back to the normal time. Sorry about the difference in um, times that we've been uploading videos and stuff. It's just been a bit hectic with me coming back to uh, South Africa and we having to time it and all that sort of thing. So, and then we also recorded an episode on Saturday and all of that. So, but thank you guys for listening. Thank you for everyone. You guys are great out there. Thank the messages of um, of. Uh, Help me out, you guys. What's the word I'm looking for? About what? The messages of. Jeez, why wow, it's Friday night. <laughs> yeah, the of encouragement, messages of encouragement, appreciation, and also the hate mail, <laughs> also the hate mail and stuff out there. That's Listen, the hate, hate mail. mail hate, hate mail is good. Hate mail travels faster than. Bad news travels faster than good news. I know? would love, I would love I nothing love, I want to get hate mail. I'm not getting any hate mail. I would love nothing yeah. more than have like Eusebius McKaiser just like call us out on his show or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Call us like, out. Please. You know, watch please. McKaiser, we say I watched this show of three individuals with one Alaskan American there. It was called Reactionary Opinions and they said blah, blah, blah. I would absolutely, I'd yes. be honored. I thought yes. it would be amazing. <laughs> well, talking about <laughs> being, talking it's about the being, yeah. I talk being honored, guys. Um, I was actually quite honored because uh, my memes actually made an appearance on Carp Laundered. Oh, yeah, that's right. Wow, <laughs> you yeah, discussed all of your memes. I, I was listening, it was on Sunday evening, I was listening to the discussion on the elections, and they were saying about how boring the elections were and nothing really happened. And then they went through all yeah. of Scott's memes and they thought, ah, this is great and this is wonderful and this is. <laughs> So if there's a carp lander out there that listens to our channel, uh, you're welcome, guys. I'm glad you enjoyed them. There's uh, plenty more to come. So, uh, <laughs> and then obviously in the news, Willem Petzer got tagged by the, I mean, got, got triggered by the Fokken Haunt meme as well, which was quite funny. I enjoyed it. Stairs in, <laughs> stairs in Fokken Haunt. And then uh, I made a, another meme uh Obviously, because here's the thing, bro. Oaks need to learn to laugh at themselves, you know. And I made another meme of uh, about uh, about the ZACP with uh, with Roman Kabanek over there, and it says, "When they tell you social media campaigns don't work and you get a seat, you don't get a seat in Parliament, but you'll continue fighting the NDR." And it says, "says in degenerate." <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that one. That was quite a good one. Yeah, and the one even said, I don't, see, I don't see any lies here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the funny one that I made, which is classically off topic, but uh, it, 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 um, it's got to do with next week's topic. It's nationalists and Whigs need to get split. Stairs <laughs> in Zulu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> oh, oh God. Stairs in Zulu. Stairs in Zulu. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, guys. I think I think what we're gonna do, uh, we'll we'll do from now on, is the beginning of the episode is we'll just sort of uh, have meme of the week or whatever, and uh, I think that'll be quite fun. It's so, okay. uh, yeah. So tune in next week, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel and remember to click the bell icon for notifications. Or if you to leave leave it in the Comment section and remember to like our Facebook page and all of that. Dylan, when's our Twitter going up, bro? We need to get those Twitter battles going. Yeah, I'm actually going to start that this week. So by by next show, it should be up. Yeah, and so basically get us, get us out there. Yeah. Start plugging away. Excellent. So now, so now all of you Twitter trolls and stuff, now you know the face that uh, controls our Twitter account. It's this guy. The very racist <laughs> looking face. Yeah. Yeah, a very racist looking Alaskan face. Yeah. Oh, that's so, uh, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Uh, remember to keep making uh, South Africa great again. And uh, it's been lacquer hanging out with everyone. Uh, and we'll see you guys all next week. Remember, stay reactionary out there because God, God was it. it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it.